So hello everybody, welcome to the Open Discourse Net seminar. Uh, we are in May already, so we are. All the, this is our last but one talk this academic year, and it is our great pleasure to welcome our own Johannes Angermüller to um, to the to the seminar today. Um, he, Johannes uh, is of course very well known to all of us, so he doesn't need a long introduction. Let me just say uh, one or two things. Uh, he's a professor of discourse, languages and applied linguistics at uh, the Open University, um, where he teaches and uh, conducts most of his research. He's also one of the founders of DiscourseNet, of course, and he today he will present um, some aspects of his I guess, latest research projects on um, academic expertise and uh, citations across uh, Europe and across linguistic um, communities. So without further ado, um, over to Johannes, who will be talking to us today about representing our discipline of population of unequal academics. We're looking forward to your talk, Johannes. Yeah, thanks so much for this introduction. I will um, present some of my recent work around the actors of, um, of our fields in um, the social sciences and humanities. And um, I um, will give you some insights into the theoretical and empirical challenges of um, studying disciplines as a po population of unequal actors. It's a common practice for academics to reflect on their field. Any publication and project proposal starts with the state of the research in which the researcher gives an overview of past contributions and current gaps. This is a largely spontaneous practice based on reading around in what the specialist thinks are relevant publications. Some of our colleagues, of course, are specialized precisely in reading around a lot. Think of the authors of textbooks or handbooks, the historians of ideas and many theorists who create mappings of the most relevant literature and their problems and concepts in the field. Their practice is also known as hermeneutics, which has a long tradition in, Western, in the Western humanities. Of course, I would never say we shouldn't read around. This is a very important and oftentimes very creative practice in our world, and it's also enjoy uh, enjoyable. But it's also a spontaneous and subjective practice which may translate certain um, structures and biases uh, of our world. And uh, we should, of course, be very critical of it. For linguists, uh, this is no um, uh, new idea, of course. They're normally quite critical of the hermeneutic approach, and they prefer systematic corpus methods and analytical tools to give a more objective account of their texts. However, if you have a look at the state of the research that uh, precisely those corpus linguists uh, give of their fields, I'm not aware of any corpus linguist using um, his or her own methods in order to, um, to reflect on, on, on his own or her own field. Uh, there's, of course, a very good reason why they don't use um, their own methods in order to uh, account for their discipline. And um, that's because um, for them, um, there are just a few citations and references which are relevant. And, um, and there's so much uh, which they don't really uh, draw on. And, um, and they, they will not be interested in, in everything that, um, that, that remains outside their purview. And that's why, of course, um, the state of the research that we usually present in our publications um, focuses on a very small part of what is being published in our fields, um, and, and we leave out a, a lot. And, um, and then we claim that this is um, the field. Um, of course, uh, this is only a, a very uh, partial understanding of our field. And the question is how we can account for, for the field more systematically. There are tons of texts which are being published, uh, which we don't ever read and uh, which we don't really um, see as uh, relevant. How can we produce an understanding of our discipline? if we just pick uh, certain publications uh, that we have come across and, uh, and not all the other ones. Shouldn't we be very careful about the effects of our personal biases that give exaggerated importance to some developments and make us forget about, us, uh, about so many other publications? The hermeneutic improvisation uh, with which we produce these states of the research are of course a problem for us linguists. 
Um, and we want to um, um, also say that for us, this course analyst, this is very problematic since um, uh, the, the citations that we uh, select um, reflect, of course, uh, the dominant ones. And uh, we want to be um, um, aware of the power relations in our field. Uh, against this background, I think we need a completely different approach, an approach that recognizes that there are certain actors which are relevant for us, um, that there are actors behind the discourses and texts, as it were. And uh, we need to acknowledge that, of course, um, ours is, an, is a world which is extremely hierarchical, where only a few um, citations, people and um, questions really count for us, and, um, and not at all the many others. We shouldn't forget that our own discourse in linguistics and discourse studies is produced and driven by people who have certain positions in the institutions. And that means um, there's a certain group and community that uh, drives and feed the discourses in which we um, work. Um, therefore, we should uh, like to ask who are the linguists and the discourse researchers? Who are the people in our fields? Who are they and how do they relate to each other? This, of course, relates us to, um, refers us to so social and sociological work around uh, scientific fields and, um, and the way that um, certain areas um, are con constituted through discourse. The problem of the actors and the populations of actors has been an object of critical debate in, in the sociology of science. And I want to remind you of two concepts which um, which point out the role of the actors that come together when we participate in a discourse, like the discourse in linguistics or discourse studies. The first notion is Bourdieu's notion of a field. A field designates a social arena where actors compete for rewards and recognition. Bourdieu puts emphasis on the unequal distribution of resources the actors can use in the struggle of all against everybody, especially the economic and cultural capital that is passed on through the families. Bourdieu's method is strictly relational. The position of each actor is determined by his or her relations with all the other actors in the field. That is including those uh, with low or no resources, uh, with no visibility. And, um, and that's why it's important to give um, a representation of the field as a whole. The other notion is uh, from Foucault, that is um, um, a discourse theoretical um, um, uh, framework. And I want to remind you of the notion of the population, which Foucault introduced in his lectures on governmentality uh, late in his life. According to Foucault, in the 18th century, the population becomes an object of governmental practice. The exercise of power at the time is no longer so much about subjecting individuals under the regime of a personal power, but about monitoring and controlling the population from a distance. Power, in other words, words becomes abstract. Specialized institutional discourses, like for example, um, mathematics for insurance purposes, um, hygienic, uh, urban planning, all kinds of um, specialized uh, proto-scientific discourses are key to this kind of soft power. By representing the population and its conducts, discourse gives reality to the population and also coordinates um, the behavior of the many. Against this background, I want to come back to the way that, um, that we represent our own disciplines as populations of actors. I will present an empirical view of linguistics and discourse studies, two disciplinary fields where resources are distributed um, in unequal ways among the actors. More than Foucault, I will insist on identifying real actors and more than Bourdieu, I will point out that discourses not only reflect inequalities uh, among the actors, but also creates them. My analysis will give you an idea of the highly unequal structures within academic discourse that limit the free circulation of ideas. And um, therefore, my question will be to, to what degree can we really participate in free discourse in our own discourse? Let me give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about in my little uh, uh, talk. Um, 
There will be one part uh, about uh, our fields, uh, linguistics and discourse studies. Um, these are two parts uh, with slightly different empirical backgrounds. Linguistics, of course, is a different field from discourse studies, and I apply different methods in order to account for these two fields. Um, the first part will uh, draw on my, my recent book that just came out a few days ago on the careers of the professoriate, academic pathways of linguists and sociologists in Germany, France, and the UK. And here I will talk about uh, the population of the senior academics of our of our discipline, and um, and uh, ask what are the institutions, the career patterns, and um, I will also have a look at um, how they are cited in their publications. Um, the other empirical part is about discourse studies as a global uh, population of unequal actors. And here I draw on um, an article I just finished for the Handbook of Multicultural Discourses from Shisu. And um, I will uh, give you some ideas about how we can account for discourse studies as a, as a, as a population of um, uh, discourse researchers worldwide. And I will finish with a, a short reflection on the theoretical challenges of uh, these empirical results and, um, and ask to what degree we, we need to account for discursive and non-discursive inequalities in our fields. Um, if we want to account for a discipline um, as, as a population, as a group of, of actors um, who feed uh, the discourse of our discipline, the first question is how to identify the actors. And this is not at all uh, trivial, since there's no list of, um, um, of actors. We don't have uh, a complete list of uh, members of a discipline. Um, of course, associations are only very incomplete representations of the disciplines. And um, so what, what we did in, in, in my project, um, uh, uh, Disconnects, um, is to collect all the senior academics in linguistics and sociology by manually going through all the web pages of all institutions in three countries. And I will just focus on the UK since um, um, our time here is limited. And um, what we found is there are 129 professors of linguistics in early 2015 um, in the UK, in less than 50 um, uh, universities in the UK. So we see that um, the linguists are very much concentrated in a small number of institutions. This is not at all something that takes place all across the country. We are basically talking about 50 institutions and only 10 of which, or less than 10 of uh, which, have more than three um, professors in linguistics. So in fact, um, it's a small world, uh, especially in the UK. You, you, the UK doesn't have a lot of professors in linguistics. Uh, France and Germany are much bigger in, in terms of manpower. And, um, and interestingly, uh, we see that um, these institutions where there's a certain concentration of, of professors of linguistics, um, they're not all in London. It's relatively spread out or, uh, around the country. And uh, we, we see, for example, Manchester, um, Newcastle, um, Oxford, uh, we see um, Essex, and, um, and uh, just a few institutions in, in London. And um, if we uh, have a closer look at, um, at these professors, uh, the question, of course, is um, who are they and how have they become what they are? And, um, and this is the results uh, from my uh, uh, recent book, on the, pro, uh, on the careers of the professoriate. We uh, visualized the careers of all professors in um, these countries and in the two disciplines. And what you see here is um, uh, the eight major types of uh, careers uh, for professors in, in our fields. And what we found is that um, there's a very large degree of um, convergence and um, homogeneity of careers across um, countries and across disciplines. Uh, basically, what we see, there's a, um, there's a tendency to become a professor around 12 years after, after the PhD. Uh, of course, there's a variance and a variety. Some are a bit uh, faster, many are a bit slower. Um, but there seems to be some sort of expectation in the sector that um, you need to advance uh, at a certain speed in order to, to move into these positions. Um, almost everybody uh, who has become a professor 
had a um, an academic contract uh, just before becoming professor, in, in most cases uh, for many years. So you don't uh, get recruited from outside. Um, the very large majority of professors have a um, research and teaching contract. Um, and there's uh, just uh, a very few where this is not the case. Um, the only uh, uh, people where this is not the case are those with research contracts uh, before the professorship. Uh, this is a small minority of about of, 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 of around five or three percent. There's um, a, an even smaller uh, number of professors with a teaching profile, uh, but there's no professor who who moved from uh, immediately from directly from a teaching uh, contract to a professorship. All of the teaching profile of professors um, had uh, research in their contracts uh, just before their appointments. Um, there's um, some mobility um, across countries, but the norm is to um, get the PhD and uh, move up the positions in the same country. So in fact, uh, we see the dominance of a very um, defined uh, career regime uh, which rewards uh, conformity with a certain career structure. And, um, and in fact, of course, uh, this makes it possible um, to become a professor from certain families, uh, from certain backgrounds. And, um, and especially it's important um, to, to respect the sequence of diplomas, of positions, in order to, um, to build up a proper, um, respectable um, academic CV that allows you to... Um, to have a chance for the most senior positions. Um, another question is how to account for the uh, topics and uh, the specialties of research of these uh, professors. If we have a look at um, the specialties of UK professors in linguistics, this is a representation of, of the keywords that we found on their web page. Uh, on their web pages. So we took um, all the keywords and uh, research des descriptions from all the 129 professors of linguistics and um, then visualized uh, them in terms of dominance and of um, proximity. And interestingly, um, this is something which is quite surprising to me, uh, the most central area of research in linguistics in the UK today is discourse analysis, um, surprise. There are also some other um, areas like uh, around grammar, structure, morphology, semantics, which is perhaps a bit more traditional. And um, uh, we have um, a, another cluster, which is smaller, uh, around uh, phonology and language acquisition. Uh, of course, there's um, a, a large area of um, more social uh, inquiry into uh, social linguistics, language policy, um, and of course, uh, corpus which is also very important. The question now, of course, is to what degree um, these research topics um, dominate. And another thing that we need to, um, to really be aware of, this is no world where everybody's equal. Um, it's especially um, uh, even among those very senior academics, there's huge differences in the way that their work is cited or not. And here is a representation of the um, citation numbers of these linguists um, according to Google Scholar. And, um, and we see huge spreads between the most um, cited professors of, of linguistics and the least cited professors. And we have a few um, who are cited uh, 30,000 or more. And there's many as well who are cited just a few hundred times. And, um, and so, in fact, this is a world where some people really count and um, um, seen and um, heard by, by others. And even among the most uh, senior people, uh, there are quite a few whose research doesn't seem to, um, to have such an impact or who work in very small fields. So uh, I think we need to be very careful not to uh, mix up quantity and quality here, of course. But you can see um, there's a very strong um, 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 there's very strong evidence of, of a very strong concentration of, um, of visibility in very few people, and I, I will have more data on that. It would be great, of course, to um, integrate 
the difference of citation visibility that we see here with the previous uh, slide on the topics. I'm, I'm still working on that, and um, I, I will uh, try to, 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 to visualize the way that certain topics are made visible through the great visibility that certain individuals have in the field. Um, so um, this is one way. Um, of course, there's a great limit if we study professors, because this is a small part of the academic um, population, especially in the UK. Um, professors used to be just um, the heads of department um, or very um, exceptional kind of um, um, academics in the university. Uh, this is changing, but um, the, 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 the large majority of of academics in, in the UK, of course, are not professors. And this is something which is totally respected. And, um, and many of them are very much cited and visible in, in their fields. And um, so the question is how to account for that larger field. Uh, professors are easy to identify because they're all on, on the web pages nowadays. And um, it becomes a lot more fuzzy and uh, and difficult to, to catch all the other people who are very active, um, who read and write a lot, but who do, don't have a clear academic status. Um, it would be possible to catch all or many um, lecturers, even though it, it might be a bit more difficult, um, at least in some countries like uh, Germany. Um, and it will definitely get very difficult to catch people uh, like uh, postdoc um, uh, researchers, um, non-permanent people, um, so-called independent uh, scholars, uh, doctoral students, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, in order to get a more systematic idea of um, the entire population of, um, um, of a field, let's turn to discourse studies, which is a, uh, an interdisciplinary um, uh, population of um, people working at the crossroads of linguistics, uh, the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, what I did in order to account for uh, the more complete population of discourse researchers, I ran uh, two questionnaires uh, with DiscourseNet in order to uh, see who responds. This is a non-representative um, sample, of course, uh, from um, uh, around 1,000 uh, people who have responded to my surveys. I had sent the survey to around 8,000 um, uh, registered users on our platform, Discourse Analysis Net. So we are very far from, um, from representativity. Uh, what we can say, of course, uh, still, I think, is that these are self-declared researchers who um, have sufficient... Um, um, identification and um, and interest in discourse study uh, so as to respond to the survey and um, and interestingly the two surveys uh, which uh, I ran uh, in um, in a distance of of a year or, or two years I'm not no longer sure um, they came up with exactly the same proportions uh, according to the questions I asked the questionnaire I sent was um, <clears throat> announced in various languages. Uh, but the questions themselves were in English, so there's a strong uh, bias uh, through the questionnaire towards English. And um, yeah, let me um, give you some ideas uh, about who who are the people who responded to the survey. And I'm sure this is uh, the most um, the largest survey that we have about uh, discourse studies for for a while. Um, I asked them about their uh, disciplinary backgrounds and. Um, and uh, here you see the distribution of uh, disciplinary identities. Um, less than half of, um, of the respondents say they come from linguistics. There's all kinds of other um, disciplines uh, from um, the social sciences, especially uh, some from, uh, from the humanities. People could take more than one box. So that's why we have more than 100% here which means that um, around two thirds would place themselves in the social sciences, uh, broadly understood. And, um, and about um, a third would, uh, would see more than one discipline. Um, that's quite common uh, to, uh, to be placed in more than one um, 
discipline, and some even say th uh, three disciplines. And, um, and so um, what we see here is this is a space where people uh, identify with a classical discipline, which are established in departments in universities worldwide. Discourse studies has an existence um, which goes well beyond discourse analysis as a sub-disciplinary uh, field within linguistics. And um, it uh, resonates with people doing research in, in all kinds of fields um, across um, the SSH. Um, another question was about the um, uh, countries of work. Uh, the people who responded are, of course, extremely international. And um, since DiscourseNet um, has started in Germany and in Europe, there's a strong bias towards Ger Germany and, and Europe. Uh, but I, I guess that in the last two years, DiscourseNet has has attracted many people from outside because it's the only platform where you can uh, register um, easily and get information about uh, about calls and uh, events and discourse studies. And so we we have quite um, quite a number from from other regions. And if we have a closer look at um, regions uh, which have um, good representation, uh, there's a, a great deal of uh, of discourse research done uh, in, in countries like um, Romania, um, Turkey, Iran, uh, North Africa, in um, countries like uh, Austria. I mean, I'm talking here in relation to, to size and economic power. And, um, and so um, we see that discourse studies is, uh, is a field which, uh, which takes place um, across the whole world, especially in Latin America as well, um, in some countries. Um, not so much in the USA. Um, I mean, if you consider that the USA has more resources for research and higher education than the whole of the European Union, uh, the USA is clearly underrepresented. And you see that uh, discourse studies is not really um, established in North America. Um, different story in Canada. There's uh, long uh, schools and traditions in discourse studies in Canada, including in French-speaking Canada. And so we see that um, this is um, a whole world. Um, it's not just um, the country in which we work. <laughs> it's not only English-speaking countries either at all. And, um, and in fact, uh, there are all kinds of centers and, um, and traditions in different countries. Um, let me say that, according to the survey, um, around a quarter of the respondents are um, full professors. Um, a quarter are associate professors with permanent, mostly with permanent jobs, uh, depending on the country. And um, half of them are um, doctoral students and postdocs. Uh, this is uh, surprising because, um, I mean, all of them are, almost all of them are academics. There are very few um, non-academic people, uh, even though, of course, discourse uh, studies prides itself of being very much about impact and, uh, um, and, um, and uh, intervening in the social world. It's a very academic um, 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 area. And um, you have... Um, um, a very important role of um, non-established uh, academics um, from students, uh, grad students, and uh, up to um, postdoctoral students. Let me go on. To the languages. Yes, um, I also asked about the languages, and here we need uh, to be very careful because the, the, the questions were, were in English. But obviously, English is the lingua franca um, of discourse research uh, in a world which is extremely multilingual. So it's very important to see uh, the presence of so many other languages. And um, in fact, if you have a look at uh, the people here in the large English column, um, uh, not all of them are monolinguals at all. So uh, you have, um, I think, two thirds of, of uh, people who use English regularly who in fact uh, speak other languages and well as well, um, who use um, other languages um, um, in their private lives and also in, in, in their work. 
Um, there are some other lingua francas like uh, French and Spanish um, who are used in many countries. Um, but this is, uh, of course, uh, less um, 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 uh, recognized, perhaps. Um, I mean, the 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 uh, the arenas are much smaller for for French and for for Spanish, and um, and so um, there's different groups of languages, and, um, and 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 there's a lot of languages where there's um, uh, very few speakers. Um, and, and basically there's no critical mass for, for local national traditions of discourse studies. So people from these very small languages, uh, I mean, small, sometimes they're huge like Ordo, uh, but academically they're very small. Um, these very small languages have to go through English in order to, um, to talk to other um, people, even in their own language, uh, because um, everything will take place. So we have a number of, um, European languages, uh, which are strong enough, um, big enough, in order to have um, local traditions like German, Russian, Portuguese, um, and um, Chinese, Italian. Um, but you see that um, European languages are extremely important in a world which, of course, is way bigger uh, than the underlying European countries. And so um, I think the very interesting thing about the service to show, to see um, the uh, multilingual super diversity that we have here in our field, where English is um, used as a lingua franca with some other European languages um, in a world where many, many uh, languages coexist. Um, let me come back to my professors um, and think about uh, and say a few things about the way that citations and visibility is distributed in the field because this is not only about actors um, in institutions um, and it's it's also about the way that these actors become uh, recognized and um, they get reputation through the works and uh, the publications that um, that circulate uh, circulate in um, in academic discourse. So, in order to um, account for the um, uh, for the, for the distribution of visibility in 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 in, in our fields, I, um, I I got back to my professors in linguistics in the three countries this time, mm -hmm. and just focused on the specialists in discourse of uh, the three countries, and I identified uh, ninety nine professors in the three countries of um, two thousand sixteen, who are active um, in discourse and in linguistics. And I had a look at uh, their Google Scholar citation numbers. And um, I established there about 170,000 uh, citations altogether for these uh, 190,000, um, um, for, for these 99 professors in, in discourse. But um, even though these are the very uh, senior academics, um, there are very few um, individuals who monopolize um, a great deal of, uh, of these citations. And what we can see is that around 10% of the most cited professors, this is here the column in, in dark, in dark blue, um, they get around 50% uh, of all these 170,000 citations altogether. So we see that even in this very um, senior group of academics, um, there's um, a small group um, who um, um, who uh, represent um, um, the field uh, much more than 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 all the rest, and um, this raises all kinds of interesting questions because uh, I think we all understand this is not just about uh, performance or talent or uh, quality. It's very much about um, um, structures, about institutions, about networks. Um, what uh, what is really interesting here is that this is something that can be observed in in across uh, the, the three languages. Of course, uh, German and uh, French uh, medium discourses are much smaller. There are way fewer citations, um, according to Google Scholar, which also ha has a certain bias towards English. But um, I think um, uh, uh, the large majority of citations will be done in English. And um, and you see that. Um, uh, what, what we see over time is a, 
as a concentration of visibility in a, in a small elite of um, of uh, of academics, and um, this raises all kinds of uh, questions about to what degree our field is really open to um, the free exchange of ideas. And this is where I want to come to um, to my conclusion, and theorize a bit what ha what's happening in our in our field. If we um, have a population actor focused approach to um, to our disciplines. Um, the question, of course, is to what degree um, there are certain resources um, that are distributed among these actors in, in, in our field. And uh, what happens usually is um, there's a certain number of um, actors, of academics in the institutions, and uh, there's a certain um, uh, visibility and certain other resources that they can have. Um, and what happens is there's um, certain discursive uh, resources like visibility, citations, um, reputation, uh, which is an effect of um, people using language, um, making themselves visible through language, um, and then also making visible um, uh, uh, other people in discourse. And there are certain non-discursive resources um, like jobs, uh, regular um, income, uh, projects, um, prestige, uh, perhaps uh, through institutions, and uh, um, time, the way that uh, people can, can work on certain uh, questions uh, in, in, in their jobs. And uh, what happens is that these discursive and the non-discursive resources, in a way, they're linked together. And, uh, and here's what's happening. Um, in, in, in academic discourse, people are in, involved in all kinds of controversies can be small controversies, um, can be large controversies. Disciplines usually um, have formed around large controversies, uh, big questions that have uh, um, uh, interested many people over a long time. Sometimes uh, these uh, debates are a bit uh, 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 smaller or, or shorter. Discourse studies, of course, is a much more recent controversy over uh, the way that um, a language is used for social purposes. Um, and um, and so when these controversies happen about, around certain things, and um, there are certain people, certain references that bubble up over time, and uh, those will be uh, the few people in these controversies that everybody will see. Um, they, they represent the controversy, and um, and what happens is that um, they that very few people represent what uh, many people do, because of course, um, they are the effect of many people uh, reading texts from them and citing them. And um, so they're a product of the many people who contribute to the presence, to the visibility that these uh, few people have in the field. Um, so there's a kind of quite natural organic uh, concentration of visibility in a few people uh, who, um, who feed uh, these debates. And this is uh, something we can uh, also observe in, in, um, in, in many debates uh, where many people uh, participate. It's, all, it's almost always just a few speakers and not everybody can, can really become visible. Um, but in academia, there's another step, and this is very important to understand what's happening. The other step is um, there's the institutions who recruit um, some of the most visible people, those with the reputation, the consolidated profiles in the discipline, and um, they will um, get the permanent jobs and also the prestige. And so what happens is that um, the, the value in terms of visibility and, um, and, 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 and also of, of consolidated research that has been uh, constructed in these controversies over time in these communities by many people who are not visible. The value of, um, of these consolidated um, uh, research lines and, 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 and the actors is, um, is taken in by the institutions uh, by recruiting um, the um, representatives of these controversy, uh, controversies. And, um, and so in a way, uh, institutions buy in um, the established knowledge uh, from these debates, which uh, involve many more people than just those who are in the institutions. And, um, and this is um, how uh, there's a certain transfer of, um, of discursive labor and energy 
from uh, the many to the few. And finally, it's the institutions um, who transform that, that, that discourse of capital that, um, uh, that the recruited uh, academics have into um, prestige of institution in order to attract um, other researchers, students, of course, and, um, and uh, attract research money and, um, and, and, and all the very non-discursive resources in the field. So um, uh, disciplines are um, created around these controversies where in fact there's a um, transfer of value going on between um, the many people um, who participate in the discourse and, um, and the few um, who, um, who get recognized by the institutions. So let me um, wrap my, my talk up uh, by saying a few general things here about uh, how, how our, our disciplines work if we consider them as populations of actors. We need to recognize that um, these are field spaces where there are unequal resources um, that are distributed among academics. And um, the classical resources that uh, Bourdieu has um, always insisted on is, is of course um, the cultural, the social, the economic capital uh, of, um, of, of the actors. And, um, and I mean, a lot of Bourdieu scholarship basically says um, that uh, there's this kind of non-discursive um, capital that people have through the families mostly. And, uh, and then there's uh, the um, products, the symbolic products, um, the publications, um, the scientific works, which in a way um, they express uh, through the uh, prestige and um, the re recognition given to certain works and not to others, the underlying uh, distribution of socioeconomic resources uh, among the actors. I think this is um, slightly problematical as an idea because there's not only these non-discursive resources, but we also need to recognize there's discursive resources, which is visibility, which is entirely produced through controversies, um, through the way that people use language in order to make themselves and others visible. It's um, also taken time. It's not something that uh, takes place, place by itself. People need to read and write. They need to um, cite each other. They need to, um, to uh, put down the names uh, of each other in order to, um, to talk about each other. And um, as, um, as a consequence of many people uh, playing together um, in these controversies, um, some people will um, get a great deal of um, recognition and monopolize uh, the discourse. That's what's usually happening. Um, as, as a reminder, um, if you take um, um, the numbers of citations, according to Google Scholar of Noam Chomsky, uh, one of our legendary founding fathers of uh, linguistics, um, the total number of Chomsky is uh, two, ti two times as high as the total number of, um, um, of citations given to the whole field of discourse studies. So um, this is a world where there's an extreme um, um, inequality, extreme hierarchy between the, the few who can make a difference uh, through what they uh, publish and what they say and the many who uh, make them visible without being heard or, or seen. And, um, and the question is, uh, to what degree this is uh, something that is really conducive to what, uh, what we all want, that is the free exchange of ideas, um, the, um, um, the um, productive uh, struggle, um, um, comparison and um, competition between um, good and bad ideas. Um, and uh, what we need to recognize here, of course, is um, that uh, there's an underlying structure uh, in this course um, of extreme uh, inequality between researchers, which is uh, constituted through these um, um, discursive and non-discursive hierarchies in discourse. And uh, this, of course, limits um, the free flow, the free exchange of ideas uh, to a great uh, deal. Um, let me say to conclude, this is by no means something that we can on, o, o, only find, uh, find within academic discourse, uh, political discourses, um, all, all kinds of other discourses involving many people uh, will uh, show the same uh, sort of uh, structure. Um, the question is what to do about it. 
Um, I guess uh, we need to think about uh, this phenomenon in terms of monopoly discourse, um, um, which is very much uh, tied into economic and political structures. Um, uh, we see, of course, that um, a great deal of economic resources um, um, depend on, on the way that uh, discursive resources are, um, are distributed among the actors. And so um, nobody has any problem with, um, um, with creating rules that prevent us uh, from creating monopolies and to which uh, break monopolies in order so that, um, that the free flow of, um, of products and ideas can be, um, can be uh, guaranteed. Um, we still are a great uh, way away from uh, from from regulating discourse in the same way, and I think we need to understand that just by using language, we are not part of a free system of um, exchanging ideas, but uh, we enter um, a social discursive uh, structure in which uh, very few will dominate uh, uh, the debate. And uh, in order to create uh, some sort of meaningful um, exchange, we need to think of, of, of how to make this system more equal and more fair for, for the many who, who participate in it. So these are my ideas uh, from my recent work around um, discourse um, as a population of actors in an unequal world. Um, I hope that you have some uh, comments on this, and I'm very much looking forward to the debate.